Hello everyone, we are Jose Gomez Isla and Carmen Gonzalez from the University of Salamanca and we are glad to present this paper in the frame of the Arts in Society virtual conference in Galway. Our presentation reflects about how the images of science and art open continuous paths of dialogue between them, and not only because each of them interacts with the other as a source of constant inspiration, but above all because their respective discourses serve aesthetics and interpretative codes that are closer than we might suspect. If the artistic image was ever at the service of science, its history goes back to the first Renaissance drawings of deceptions and skinning of human corpses. We have all in our minds amazing anatomical drawings of artists such as Leonardo or Michelangelo. This practice would get passed to the first illustrated treatise on anatomy, such as the famous Atlas of Andreas Vesalius. But what is more difficult to discern from this very unique period, also the foundational moment of the scientific method, is how to classify the notes and drawings of these great masters who studied all kinds of natural phenomena. Should they be exclusively linked to the genius of the creator who interpreted reality with his subjective gaze, or rather should they be attributed to the analytical eye that scrutinized that reality and described it with a purely scientific interest? The answer to both questions is difficult, especially in that period when science and art still did not travel parallel paths, they were still mutually involved or even when those same paths clearly began to separate. We must not forget that the humanistic culture, which had been recently released at that time, was also the one that shaped the conception of art itself, as we understand it now. Until art began to conceive of itself as such, that is, until it was crossed with modern terms such as creativity, innovation or style, it did not openly separate itself from science. At the same time, around the same period, science would also begin to thread new paths of more systematic interpretation with which it attempted to explain its own conception of the world. Since then, and well into the 19th century, the figure of the illustrator at the service of the scientist or naturalist would be essential to disseminate new scientific findings through illustrated analysis in many of the fields in which science would diversify its knowledge botany, zoology, astronomy, physics, medicine, natural science, geography, etc. However, the eruption of photography during the second third of the 19th century meant an unprecedented debacle for the profession of the draftsman to whom until then the image of science had been delegated. From that moment, an almost absolute divorce between the artistic image and the scientific image would be staged, produced under the apparent and infallible objectivity of the eye of the camera. The photographic new vision would be used for several decades as a throwing weapon to discredit any interpretation of the science illustrator that was now considered obsolete and outdated. To illustrate this visual paradigm switch produced throughout history, we can analyze as a significant example the research work carried out by dozens of scientists and artists over several centuries on phenomena, such as the behavior of water or another type of fluids. During the years of observation, these authors captured in images the operation of this type of phenomenon in different contexts and conditions of observation and manifestation. The study would become increasingly complex until it ended in the conceptualization of fluid mechanics, understood as a branch of physics that would be theoretically based on hypotheses, laws and general equations. If we go back, for example, to the analysis work carried out by Leonardo da Vinci on the movement of water, 
we can see how the fruit of his acute observations would give rise to a huge corpus of beautiful images that tried to capture and interpret the fluid behavior. Through drawings and his written observations, Da Vinci tried to reflect the behavior and logic of water in its most diverse manifestations. But without certain vision eyes or machines, the human eye was still too slow to retain the scenes and fully understand the mechanics of fluid motion. Likewise, and already in the 19th century, specifically since 1875, the scientist Arthur Mason Warrington would devote himself for several decades to observing the fault, impact and the splash of a drop of water or other liquids with similar behaviors such as mercury or milk. In this case, the researcher used a primitive type of instantaneous light, a kind of precarious flash, to try to stop fix or at least isolate from its temporal flow a very specific infinitesimal instant that would allow him to appreciate the movement of the splash of a drop at a specific moment of impact. To do this, he had to ensure that this moment of illumination became a latent image of his retina. Over the years, he devoted himself to an observation that he believed to be detailed, systematic and rigorous, thanks in particular to the primitive instantaneous light system he used. Warrington would produce a series of beautiful drawings from the observations described in his notebook on this liquid phenomena, in a similar way as Leonardo himself did in his day. In the graphic expression of his observations, Warrington would progressively describe how the impact of a fluid frozen in very short time periods, practically one millisecond, on a flat surface gave rise to different states and shapes of that drop after impact. What was common in all the cases observed was that this status were governed by scrupulous regularity and an overwhelming and almost perfect circular symmetry. Warrington's research would decisively help the development of fluid mechanics as a specialized science. Worthington's drawings made by direct observation and with the naked eye, although with the help of the flash, always seemed reliable enough to him so that he never questioned his own perceptive ability to study this phenomena. But the technology of that time still did not allow to fit the instantaneous light originally used by Worthington to a camera. However, decades later, specifically in 1894, and thanks to technological innovations that significantly increased the sensitivity of emotions and the speed of shutter release of the new cameras, Worthington managed to fix the photographic image for the first time frozen from a drop at the precise moment of impact against a surface or other fluid. The photographic records and the conclusions that Worthington made from that moment with this improved technology allow him to question, in light of the results, that until that date had only been analyzed by direct observation. His disappointment was capital. The idea of perfect symmetry that he had maintained in all his previous drawings was not corroborated at all with the photos obtained now. In light of this new snapshot, his theories on the regularity and symmetry of fluids heating and splashing were to be completely invalidated. Under the new paradigm of scientific objectivity that now embodied the mechanical eye of the camera, Worthington was forced to reject and deny those fantastic drawings that he had been making for the previous two decades. Beginning in 1895, Worthington only accepted the objective view of the camera as valid because he considered that it was the only one that provided real knowledge and not an idealized expression of imaginary and symmetrically perfect forms. However, innovation and technological progress can also deny or at least amend certain premises that would have been taken as true in the past, based on the results of previous technologies. 
even the same certainties that could be inferred in their day in the light of a certain observation or recording device, might end up being questioned later by that same improved device. This was the case, for example, of an MIT researcher named Harold Edgerton, who worked tirelessly in his laboratory between the 30s and 70s of the 20th century to perfect and innovate the visual capture devices that had been used until then. He was who relentlessly developed and perfected the electronic flask and the strobe devices that he himself had invented in the late 20s. With the help of these devices, Edgerton worked with photographic record and the cinema's low motion camera, also invented by him, to pursue new forms of perfection, symmetry and geometric beauty, just the same visual perfection and beauty that Worthington previous photographic evidence had outright rejected only a few decades earlier. Those same phenomena that these other authors have managed to record in hundreds of a second, Edgerton would be able to freeze them in fractions close to a millionth of a second. As a result of the unexpected findings of his experiments, Edgerton would each time draw new conclusions to catch almost perfect geometric movements with light, both of the human body and of course of fluids. By pure perseverance, by repeating the same experiments over and over again, he would find the ideal conditions for those movements frozen in his images to be expressed with maximum plasticity. He was tirelessly searching for the appropriate methodology to photograph each movement in all its splendor and for these images to express the unprecedented beauty of the invisible. In fact, the impact caused by the, his images, not only in the scientific field, but uh, in a multitude of activities where his technology continues to be used, covers an endless number of fields where ultra-fast photography and super-slow motion have opened the eyes to new creative territories of knowledge and ranging from the engineering world itself through physics, zoology, advertising to art itself. But uh, what it is possible to verify is that he was not satisfied with the first results, but he repeated over and over the same experiment until obtaining the most overwhelming and fascinating image that available technology allowed him. In his case, the figure of this inventor, engineer and photographer units all the qualities necessary to become, at the same time, a creator and a scientist in equal parts. In the presentation speech where he was awarded the Jim McDermott Award of the Council of, for the Arts at MIT in 1985, his photographic work was prized in the following terms. It is an image of intensity and subtlety, of soul and substance, of beauty and precision. It surprises and delights us, not least because it rewards our hope that art and technology can come together with lightness of touch. The photograph can stand for the man. Apart from his enormous creative capacity as an inventor and engineer, his enormous legacy as a photographer of the invisible prevents us from separating Edgerton's scientific character from the purely artistic one. Like a contemporary Leonardo, the direct application of his electronic devices in scientific experiments and his particular way of creating and experimenting with photography has generated some of the most beautiful and amazing images of the 20th century. We do not know to what extent Edgerton himself was able to predict the way in which such surprising compositions appeared in his images, since he himself claimed that many of his visual findings were completely unexpected. One of his most iconic images is precisely a drop of milk 
that generated a kind of almost perfect diadem or chrome topped at the tips by equidistant radial microdoplets produced by the effect of impact. This photograph, titled Drop Milk Coronet, taken in 1957, was the culmination of more than 25 years of work in search of aesthetic perfection. Proof of the deep imprint that Etcherton's legacy has left on current forms of art, thanks to his surprising photographic compositions of frozen movements, as if they were architectures of the invisible, is that many current creators are still subjugated by them. And they continue to draw inspiration from the unique beauty of these experiments that have already become childless. A photographer so close to visual poetry, such as the Spanish artist Chema Madoz, has made his own tribute to the mythical image of the Edgerton Splash, recreating with his own visual rhetoric the morphology of that primordial drop of milk that forever changed our way of seeing and understand the world. We can conclude that since the mid 20th century, new scientific images have gradually recovered and opened a continuous dialogue with the arts and their expression through aesthetic beauty and perfection because their respective discourses serve aesthetic codes and interpretations. The eloquent example we have seen helps us to see how the representation and analysis of fluid mechanics approached from the newest scientific and aesthetic perspectives has been changing as new technical advances and new methods of observing the phenomenon have been produced. Along these same lines, we can find countless other examples where art and science have taken hands to look at each other from complementary shores. Such is the case of Duchamp's nude descending a staircase, or the proposal of Italian futurism inspired by Marais' fascinating chronophotographs. But we also find reverse cases, where an artistic proposal inspires scientific or technical solutions. This is the case of Alexander Calder, whose creation of mobile sculptures in an unstable balance inspired the concept of tensegrity. This concept was coined by Kenneth Snelson, whose technical development would be applied in engineering, architecture and other technical fields. In our work, we have analyzed points of connection between the new narratives that teach of this knowledge, science and art have been systematically producing in recent decades. Now, we are also observing how the emergence of digital culture and the use of big data in many areas of current science has progressively turned to the graphic translation of this data to be understood and assimilated through certain visual codes that allow its interpretation. Somehow, what art can bring us is a transformation of that data into an affordable image with a load of emotional meaning, which is to say that they cease to be pure data and become the comprehensive metaphor, something closer to an experience.